Welcome back to the Budding Author Podcast. Uh, we're talking to authors about their journeys. And today we have a very special guest, a book and novel editor and uh, founder of the very special Your Book Angel. We have Kylie Keating. Welcome to the show. Hi there, Simon. Thank you for having me on the show. Oh, uh, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. <laughs> right then, we'll sort of get straight into it. Um, you've been around the world for writing for a while. What inspired you to start writing to start with? It was it uh, an early journey for you or is it something you came to later? Oh, definitely early for me. Yes, I was reading any word apparently at the age of two and my mum used to get the Guardian newspaper and open it up when we were at family gatherings and ask me, the, you know, the longest words possible. So I was reading early and that naturally read, uh, led to writing early. So I'd write little stories at the age of three and I would have like a front cover and ISBN number on the back. And um, yeah, so I've, I've been doing this like your book angel for about 20 years now. Um, it's been my uh, career. It has been in writing and in helping yeah. other people with their books as well. So, um, 20 years. Obviously, you've got some youth serum that you're using there, I think. Um, <laughs> what uh, What was your first job? What job did you do before you crossed over into writing or was writing your first job effectively? Um, well, I did a, a college sort of, not a degree, but a college course in journalism. And um, that's really where I started out. I got a job on a local newspaper as a reporter. But I didn't last there long. I think I was there for three months and I realized that it was really to the point writing and it was too boring for me. And yeah. I'm more of a creative person. So I just couldn't do it anymore. And I ended up then getting a job in London and I worked for magazines. And then with magazine writing, you can be a bit more creative with your vocabulary and just the way that you write something. So that was definitely a better fit for me than the newspaper uh, writing. But um, I, I, even with that, I quickly learned that it wasn't really for me either. But I did do the magazine editing for, I think, about five years that I was in London working at various different magazines. Um, some of them were corporate, you know, corporate magazines. And a couple of times I worked for uh, Hello magazine. Because yeah. um, I would go in and like do freelance at some of these places as well. So it was uh, pretty good. But then my mum and dad decided to move to Spain. And I thought, why be retired to move to Spain? You know, like, why not move there at the age of 23? So I did. Oh, lovely. <laughs> I lovely. followed them over and quickly found that the life in Spain was much nicer and more enjoyable than life in the UK. Um, especially considering the weather in the equation. So I, yes. but I didn't speak Spanish and not speaking Spanish, I didn't really know what I was going to do here for a job. So what happened is after about, I think I was here for about uh, three or four months without knowing what I was going to do for work and anything. Um, basically, there was an expat magazine, you know, those, I don't know if you've been to Spain, you know, before yeah. you get those little sort of English language magazines that come around and they sort of distribute them at bars and restaurants and places like that. Well, there was one of those that the man who did it suddenly died. He was quite young. He was only about 40 something. And his dad spoke to my dad and basically said like well did you if your daughter wants to do the magazine and carry it on then i'd be happy for her to do that because otherwise the magazine will just die with my son so yeah. i did i basically had to find out how he did it and everything and and i ended up sort of relaunching this magazine that he had started originally and um it's still going today 20 years later my sister now runs it so it, it worked out, you know, it's a, a magazine where companies advertise in it, you know, so that's how you make your income from the yeah. company. And then I would write articles and things like that in the magazine as well. Um, so, yeah, and then basically that led to me writing my first book, which was called Soul Searching. Uh, it's a play on words, S-O-L searching, but it's kind of searching for the sun, but also sort of searching inside. Uh -huh. Or who yeah. am I and what do I want from life and all of that. 
And so I wrote that book and it, there was a lot of books at the time by people, you know, like again, retirees who had come to live in Spain and they had written books about that experience, but there weren't hardly any books, if any, about a young person's point of view from moving yeah. to Spain. And so that was the concept. And it was supposed to be funny. I say supposed to be, I mean, I don't know if it actually was or not, but I did actually get a publisher for that book. So um, it was just a small company. It was called Summertime Publishing, I believe. It wasn't one of the, you know, it wasn't one of the top five or anything. Um, but they said they would publish the book and they did. And, um, you know, that was that. Like, that was my first experience of getting my, a book published. So uh, you've, you've sort of, obviously, the, the writing has been sort of in your blood for uh, from the start then, really. And it, it's interesting you, what you say there, for your, particularly for your first book, it's very much writing about what you know. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I found we've that. We've worked on tips yeah. before, haven't we, where sort of yeah. don't sort of go too far left field when you sort of first start writing. You sort of write what you know, and then maybe as you become more experienced, then your creative side sort of jumps off into other directions. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's, I think that was a lot easier for me to write and tackle a book like that based on my actual experiences than it would have been to write like a fantasy novel or something at that moment in my life, you know. Um, so that worked out quite well. Um, and then, you know, from there, I basically decided to start my own company, um, helping other people get their books published, um, because I kind of got bored doing the magazine fairly quickly. And I wanted to go more into writing, but I didn't really know what to write at this point, you know, what yeah. next book to write. So I thought I would just, you know, and the book didn't necessarily sell amazingly or anything. I mean, it, it sold OK, but not like I would have wanted when you have these dreams of being a best selling author, you know, where you're selling like a, enough copies of a book to make a living. It wasn't like that. So did, I decided. Did that, knock, did that knock your confidence when you didn't get as many copies sold as you thought? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Because I, I think when you're very naive, like I kind of was at the age of 20 something, I, I, I always had like big dreams and big goals. And I still do to this day have big dreams and big goals. But I was sort of in a naive kind of a way, just sort of thought like, oh, yeah, of course it's going to sell, you know, thousands of copies. Um, but it didn't. And so, yeah, probably did knock my confidence a little bit. Not that I really remember that, especially. Um, but I did decide at that point that I still wanted to do, to write books and to help other people with their books. Um, and I knew that I could also make an income from doing that so that I was yeah. still in the field that I wanted to be in, but not necessarily in the way that I foresaw that I would be in it, you know? Um, I, think, I think with the... Uh with book sales it's it's always a challenge really whether because you, you look like for myself um i've released some books and uh, i haven't hit sort of bestseller lists and that sort of thing but is it the i haven't gained enough traction right uh, none of people have seen the books um have i not marketed the book very well or it, or is it just not very good and it, it's it's difficult sort of I, my mind spins around different things i i've had some very good comments back from my books um but then you still sort of doubt yourself that but then gaining track it's the gaining traction is the hard bit i think right yeah exactly building a following and then when you release any new book people want to buy it i think that's as yeah. well part of it you know getting a following in a bigger way so uh, how, how would you what's the best way of building a following because <laughs> I'll send you a Twitter follow. You've got 220,000 yes. followers on yes. Twitter. Yes, I do There's have a lot of people followers. looking at what you're saying. That's it. Right. Yeah, I have to admit, though, even though I do have a lot of followers, followers on Twitter, one of the keys is making sure that you keep on, um, like, so say when someone comments on your posts on Twitter, is it all about engagement? And I'm, I have to say, and I'm going to be completely honest, I, I do lack that right now. Like, I, if somebody comments on my post, I don't reply on it because I just don't have the time at this point in my life to do that. 
um, because I'm very busy with my business. And also I have an eight year old son who I homeschool and, you know, life is just busy. So I don't have time. If I had time to do that, that's called engagement, where you engage with the comments that other people leave on your posts, then I think that my account would not only be a lot larger, but also I would get a lot more um, traction on the posts, you know? Yeah more people commenting and a lot more people liking it or whatever they do on twitter so yeah i think that's one of the keys if you're going to build a big twitter account then you have to have a way of maintaining it and that's where i've broken down a little bit in the last few years um but in terms of building the the following i have a system that i use to do that and basically the way that i do it is i follow big like I follow places where authors would be already following. So let's say, for example, Random House. Okay, Random House yeah. is one of the biggest publishing companies in the world. Well, a lot of the people that follow Random House are writers because they want to, you know, they want to follow the publishing company's journey. They probably aspire to be an author of Random House. You know, Writer's Digest is another one that you probably find a lot of writers would, would yeah. follow. Things like that. I mean, there's a lot of different ones. And so then I follow them and then I would look at all their followers. So then you can go to Writer's Digest followers. And then I just go and follow a load of those people. So these are probably a lot of them are going to be writers. Yeah. And so then they kind of see that I've followed them and they probably look at my account and see that I help writers. And then I basically then have someone, I don't do it myself, um, but I have somebody, um, I think she's based in India, actually. She, she sends a welcome message to every single one of my new followers on Twitter. Oh, yeah. You know, just introducing myself, not in a sousy way at all. You never want to make it sousy, but just an introduction message. Um, you know, just sort of introduces myself and what I do. And if you ever need any help with anything, then let me know, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. It's a very sort of low key, just intro message. And I find that that really helps. Um, you know, this is talking more about my business right now, but the same thing, the same approach could be used for selling books, um, where you would have a welcome message and just introduce the fact that you're an author and you have these books out. And if you ever, you know, feel like just a very sort of the general message that's not pushy in any way i think that's yeah. okay you don't want to come across as pushy but i think that that's a good way of doing it and that's how i built up my twitter account to that amount like i've just done that every single day um and i do have someone helping me you know to do that but it does, it does get quite busy help. doesn't it? it it does get quite busy i have a i have yeah. another show I have another shout that for a, a football team I follow, Warsaw, and oh. um, on the on Warsaw Fan TV, I do get a lot of comments and I reply to all of the comments. But as the channel's grown, that takes more and more of my time. Yes, exactly. And it sort of yeah, it does become a bit of a challenge, really. And yeah, it it does time. I think that sometimes just hiring the right person to do that. I haven't got to that stage yet of hiring someone to comment. Because for me, that's more personal. I don't know if I trust someone to, to comment on things, but I do have the, the lady in India. She's really nice and good at what she does. She's the one that goes and does all the following and she sends the intro messages. Uh, and then yeah. when people respond to the intro messages, then that's me that replies to those, you know, to those yeah. responses. Um, but I find that like bit by bit, you can kind of build up so, sort of like, you know, so maybe the next step will be that I do find someone to comment on them. But then to me, that feels a little bit inauthentic. So I'm not yeah, sure about yeah. that. I, I'd rather be the one that does it myself. I feel like I just need to find a bit more time every day. <laughs> for that. And then of yeah. course, the more comments you get, the more you have to find more time. So well, again, I have that problem. If I reply to a comment and they reply to my comment, then I'm, I'm sort of, it's in yeah. a loop really right exactly well you probably stop at some point I, I would say you just probably reply once and then if they reply to that you probably don't reply again if you kept yeah. doing it it would just be ongoing forever maybe <laughs> <laughs> well i think if i think if if they're doing that through my channel then that's good for engagement in a lot yes. of um, right. on twitter i don't engage with twitter as much for that oh, reason yeah. 
um because there's, there's less perhaps benefits from doing that yeah and, that's true. but i'm on for my author stuff i am sort of trying to engage more on twitter yeah. and, um, and get more involved on that because the new show the budding author podcast show is, is talking to authors and i want to encourage more authors to interact with me yeah um for i love hearing people's stories um, <laughs> and uh, the tips the tips to help me on my writing journey and everybody else that watches the show sort of helping on their journey um you mentioned um your helping hand in india the dirty word perhaps is ai um oh, where, AI, yes where do, you, where do you stand on ai in all its uh, various guises that are oh, jumping out at us? yeah to be honest i've not looked into it as much as i should have done but just the very term and the concept of it sort of causes me to get tense a little bit. Um, <laughs> the reason being is that I'm also a ghostwriter and I write books for CEOs and company founders. And a lot of, um, so I use LinkedIn as a tool to kind of, you know, help me find clients or help them find me as a ghostwriter. And I've noticed in the last year, I've been getting more people responding to me saying, do you use AI to write the books or do you, you know, or why would I um, ask you to write my book when I can get it done through AI? And I always respond and say, well, AI doesn't have heart or soul in it. <laughs> That's just what the writing with AI to me it doesn't have, you know, everything has an energy, like even, even writing, you, you can feel the energy of that person or the energy infused into the emotion, that yeah. writing, the emotion. You don't get that with AI. So the writing's never going to be that good. I mean, it's never going to be that moving. It's never going to be. And so I just tell people that. And when it comes to business, certain business operations, maybe AI is useful for. But I wouldn't suggest it for kind of getting people's attention in the written form so much. Yeah. I, I personally yeah. wouldn't anyway. <laughs> I'd, probably agree. I'd probably agree with that. I, it's something... I, I've seen I've seen videos on it and that sort of thing and all the mm. benefits that it can bring, but whenever I start looking closer into it, it's like I have a, right. bit, of a, I have yeah. a bit of a fog and like oh no, I can do without this. <laughs> yeah, and I think that technology is just all going a bit too far. To be honest, I feel like you know I like some technology and everything, but I, I feel like it, if you know, it, it can go too far. Like I noticed that there's a new McDonald's that's just opened in Denver in the US and it's all automated. There's no humans there at all. Like it's just a robotic McDonald's. You go to it, you type in what you want. They, you know, the robot gives it to you somehow. And that to me is just, just not on. Like I, I'm just not going to engage in companies like that at all. Well, I don't we've got something similar at, um, Bella Italia. I don't know whether you have those in the US. Uh, I've heard of it. Yeah, I don't know if we have it there or not, but I've definitely seen it somewhere. <laughs> so, they have uh, they have robot waitresses that sort of right. uh, bring the food out to you. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of strange. I, I'm I'm still sort of old school. When I go to a supermarket, I want to go through the cashier, not through yeah. the scan thing. Right, have a conversation um, with them when you check out. You know, that's yeah, a bit of personality, isn't it? And yeah, uh, human interaction. I think if we shut that all down, we're going to all be walking around like zombies gone wrong. You know, and of course, <laughs> and of course, human interactions, um, learning about people's characters mm. is all good for helping when you're thinking of new yeah, characters. Exactly. Your... Right. <laughs> Unless you're writing a robot sci-fi or something, then <laughs> it's funny. actually, it's funny you mentioned that. One of my books is sort of robot sci-fi. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. So my um my my first three books, uh, my my first trilogy, um, they sort of merge into AI. Uh, oh. Sort of uh, the the robot robot android sort of thing. Mm. the human uh, human robot effectively i think that's sort of <laughs> one, one element of many aspects too if it's more of a relationship drama really oh okay yeah. but it has robots in it that sounds but, interesting. Uh, it sort of gets to that point it's a, a very sort of fast-paced sort of flying through but um 
what's uh, what's your writing process? So uh, your first draft, how long will that normally take you? Um, oh gosh, it varies so much because I've written children's picture books and obviously they're a bit faster because they're so much shorter. Um, and then I've written self-help spiritual um, and some of those were compilation books. So they weren't just me writing in it, but I would collect stories from other people. Oh, yeah. So I think for me, I don't have one particular way of doing it because I've written so many different books. But I guess the, pop the best comparison is probably the middle grade fiction book that I wrote called Into the Stars. It's about a little boy that's kind of sucked into space and all the constellations are alive up there, you know? And so it's like they have, they need help with this big thing, this big issue. And he is the one that's been chosen to help them. And that one took, um, you know, that one actually I'm still working on now. Again, it's finding the time because my business is helping writers and editing books, ghostwriting books. I don't have a lot of time to actually work on my own books right now. You know, I mean, I have a little bit of time at the weekends sometimes, but then I do have an eight-year-old son who li likes to be kept occupied too. And <laughs> so really... Is your son a big reader yet? Um, he reads, yeah, he reads certain kinds of books he gets excited about. But um, yeah, like he likes kind of quirky, wacky kind of books, you know, for the eight-year-old sort of boy angle. Yeah. But um, if I asked him to read like a classic or something, I wouldn't say he's into th those kinds of books yet. And he was a late reader. Like I was two, like I was reading any book at the age of two, whereas, you know, he, he didn't really start reading till he was about four or five, I think. So. Um, uh, my, my boys, uh, we really had trouble getting my boys to read. That was uh, a right challenge. We oh. get a... Uh, we, me and my wife used to read to our children, but um, getting them to sit down and read. As, yeah, uh, they didn't want to do it. Do they read now? Um, they... Only bits, only when they want to. It's not, yeah. they, don't read books, they don't read many books, really. Oh, okay. So not that's, uh, <laughs> they're more into the uh, the gaming. and. Yeah, well, that's uh, it, gaming. That that's sort of what thing. they do now. Yeah. The, um, is it is it normal for most authors to have several projects running concurrently or would it be better to just have one project only because uh, for me at the moment before you answer this question for me at the moment i have uh, have a, a ya series eight episode ya series that i've done the first draft on um uh, a children's story a, a young children's book i've done plus i've got another why I store larger why I novel that I'm working on all at the same time, sort of dropping into different ones depending on what's happening. Uh, yeah, I would say that some people are able to do that if you've got a certain kind of mind. And I mean, I have that kind of mind and that's how I can ghost write five books at the same time. You know, I think if you're the sort of person that's able to compartmentalize what you're doing and not let it sort of bleed into the other projects and not get confused between them and things, then you're fine to do that. Um, I think if you're doing it as a career and you want to sort of, you know, have this as your kind of income producer, let's say, and, and you're really kind of intent on it, I think the best approach would be to work on one thing at a time because it's the magnifying glass with the leaf approach, you know, energetically yeah. speaking, if you're putting all your energy into one project, you're going to burn the leaf a lot quicker with the magnifying glass than if you were to put the magnifying glass all over the place. Yeah, the okay. leaf will never burn like that. <laughs> you I know. think with with um, with the YA series, it's it's sort of I'm I'm um, sending it out for sort of broadcasters, a uh, broadcasting mm. agent. So uh, I've I've edited the first the first uh, episode. Where I've sort of left the rest to see right. what direction it takes. So, uh, so in in some ways that's sort of semi finished. So I've sort of taken yeah. that and put that aside. And then the other story I'm working on has it, re it references a children's story. But it references a children's story that doesn't yet exist. So I've written that children's story to connect the two stories. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. If that makes sense. That sounds good. Yeah. So have you got any? Um agents yet interested in your books 
Um, well, I'll say for the for the YA series, I've sent that out sort of for mm -hmm. reviews a couple of weeks ago. So that's only sort of new in uh, in there as well. I don't currently have an editor or a publisher. So that's something uh, I'm looking forward to. Yeah. Um, the challenge for me, for obviously with your, your main business, with uh, your book, Angel, with editing, when when you start in the process of writing, getting an editor is important. But there's a there's a cost payoff, isn't there? Yeah. And um, yeah. And, and no one wants to be think they're sort of like throwing lots of money at it, not knowing if they're going to get a return for that. Right. Money. Yeah, so, that is true. You never have a guarantee with with uh, publishing because it's such a yeah. It's just such it's just something you never know. Like some of the projects I've worked on I think oh that's definitely going to get an agent and then it might not and then some of the projects I've worked on where I think well I'm not sure this is good enough for an agent and then they'll get one and a publisher so it's just something that you just can't really guess on when it comes to that stuff I've noticed um, and yes I think that for the main part the people that want to that know they're going to publish their book either way so they know that even if they don't get it traditionally published because they can't get one of those on agent, then they're going to self-publish it. Most of the time, most people are OK with the cost because they know that either way, they want to make sure it's edited and the best it can be when they get yeah. it out there. But I think if you're intent on, let's say, um, on traditional publishing and you know that you won't publish it unless you get it traditionally published, then that's why some people can sometimes, you know, find it hard to pay out money for editing because they don't know the outcome and they don't know if it will ever actually get published or not in that regard. So it's uh, just one yeah. of those. <laughs> I suppose that for, for those that are working and earning well, so uh, yeah. it's, it's a hobby, it's a cost of a hobby effectively, right. and, uh, burden. But if you're doing yeah. it more full time, or if you sort of approach yeah. retirement, um, then mm -hmm. sort of the cost needs to be understood and balanced. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So some people like will, will have like a payment plan set up where they'll pay so much a month and things like that, you know. So a, a lot of editors might be flexible in that way. Um, I mean, I, I, we, I am in my company. That's what I do. But I don't. I can't speak for other editors. But I'm sure that there are some that do the similar sort of thing with that. Um, but yeah, it's difficult when it comes to the cost about knowing. You know, again, I think if you know you're publishing either way, then you definitely want to make sure you're putting out the best piece of work you can. So yeah. a lot of people can substantiate that more. But if it's someone that is only going to traditionally publish, then really I would say the only form of editing that I would suggest in that case is developmental because yeah. when you get a publisher, they typically do the copy editing aspect. But developmental editing is much more vast, obviously, than that. It's looking at all the bigger picture stuff and making sure that the, the book works and the technicalities yeah. of it and everything. And so when agents look at books, if they can see that there's not a lot that needs doing developmentally, they're going to much more likely take that on as opposed to a book that is just obviously not been looked at in that way. Yeah. You know, so developmental editing is the one form of editing that I think is, is sort of more necessary um, than copy editing. But if you're self-publishing, then you probably want to get copy editing as well. Yeah. <laughs> but, but traditional publishing, like I said, they will to have a copy editor assigned to your project at that point. Once you get once you get one set up. <laughs> what what amazes what amazes me is um, when you when you read published books and then you see errors in published books and you think, yeah, oh, it's gone through a publishing route. Yeah. And, and there's clear errors in there and there's things that don't sort of add together. Mm. And maybe I don't know whether I see deeper into it than some people. Some people perhaps just mm. enter themselves in the story. But right. being sort of with with writing and editing myself, <laughs> I'm I'm sort of looking for errors yeah. and looking for mistakes all the time. So um Right. Well that's more the proofreading. So you know, most books will go through developmental editing. That's the bigger picture, the structure, and then copy editing, which is the words and the sentences and sort of polishing those more. And then proofreading, which is 
typos grammat and grammar spelling punctuation and grammar and yeah. that's really it so sometimes um you know it's really the last point part of that where I think it can break down that's the proofreading stage and again if there's somebody that's self-publishing let's say and they've already spent money on developmental editing and then they've spent money on copy editing and then they then you know then it's like well now you have to get it proofread as well then that can really add up you know to a lot more of an expenditure so, so you, you think if, if you're only going to do one of those you'd probably do the uh, developmental editing when it comes to getting a traditional publisher, yes. But if you're self-publishing, you really ought to go through the whole three stages of editing. Yeah. Because it's your name on there. And, yeah, I mean, I feel like if you're just really good at one of those yourself, like the proofreading, for example, like if you're the sort of person that catches errors easily, you may not have to pay a proofreader to do it. Um, yeah. You could just do it yourself or maybe get some family and friends to read it because... Spelling, punctuation, and grammar is quite sort of, you know, most people know how to spell and <laughs> typos, you know. But when it comes to the copy editing and the uh, and the developmental editing, if you're self-publishing, I would definitely get both of those done. Yeah. yeah. Did you, have you ever used Pro Writing Aid or Grammarly? Uh, gra yeah, I've used Grammarly before, like ages and ages ago. And um, it does pick up certain um, errors, but it won't pick up it won't pick up everything because it's. I mean, that's more again for proofreading, really. Yeah. And that's not so much copy editing. So they're again two different things. But yeah, Grammarly you could use to pick up certain errors for sure. Yeah, yeah I I have uh, I have Pro Writing Aid. Um, oh, okay. but I I tend to argue with it. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to make a now I don't want to do that. Right. Yeah, you may not agree with everything. And even as an editor, I would say, you know, you don't have to agree with everything your editor says because no. editing is a lot of it is opinion, especially developmental editing. Yeah. Um, developmental editing, a lot of opinion. And, you know, the writer just might not agree with certain things. Now, I will say that in my experience, writers tend to agree with at least 95% of whatever comments are made in a manuscript in my opinion yeah. in my experience but yeah there may be a few things that they just don't agree with or you know can't see how to change that so they will just yeah. leave it as it is in that sense in that case i had a, I had a, a chat with an editor who sort of uh, had a look over some of my work for the it was the billy spark the uh, ya series and uh, she, yeah. she came up with some comments on it so uh, we had a, a quick zoom call and talked through it and after, after I'd gone through the discussion with her, she agreed with most of them that I was right. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. I think it was it, it was just as not wanting to sort of delve too much in the detail, but I think it was referring to somebody as his dad, and then, because so that would be not capitalised, but then if he was right. talking to him, he would About be dad. dad. That's why he's, yeah, so it's... Yeah. She, 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 was, uh, she was saying about the... I should stick to one. I was well. No, that's not strictly true. Yeah. No. Exactly. No. You're right. Yeah. You would do his dad would be a lowercase d, but if you're saying like dad this, dad that, that would be yeah, uppercase. Yeah. yeah I, I use the and a lot of editors will use the Chicago Manual style guide when it comes to things like that. You know. Chicago like, Manual style guide. Yeah. Yeah, that's like the sort of editing bible. You know, <laughs> that and a lot of publishing houses use that as well. Um, final question before we finish. We are sort of running out of time. Procrastination. Um, <laughs> where does that sit with you and how do you deal with it? Um, for me, procrastination is something that I I would say that I'm, I'm not too bad with that, actually. Like, if I, I think for me right now, see, it's different at different times of your life. I wouldn't say that I have procrastination. I would say I have a time issue. <laughs> you know, that's different. But procrastination is when, like, you you have the time and you just keep putting off doing it. You know, you keep putting off writing the book or whatever. Um, I would say that, um, yeah, a lot of the writers I work with have that issue, especially when they do get their manuscripts back from me. And then they have to, like, input the changes. You know, they have to sort of make those changes developmentally to the manuscript. Um, and so, yeah, it's a big issue with writers and i would say that um 
if there was a cure, then I think everyone would want to know what it is. <laughs> but I feel like sometimes just going out for a walk or something can, you know, clear your mind and like get you yeah. back into sort of maybe wanting to do it or, uh, but I haven't had a great deal of experience with procrastination because I'm more of a sort of very active person. Like if I want to do something, I just do it. And I don't really like to hang around, actually. I feel like I'm wasting time when I do yeah. that. So I'm probably not the best person to ask about procrastination because <laughs> for me, it's more the opposite. I feel so frustrated right now that there's things I want to work on, but, I, but I've got my business and my clients come first in all cases, yeah. you know, because they're, um, and that's how also my income and how I work right now, my business. Oh, and where the money's coming from, yeah, that's right, it. exactly. And then I, you know, that's what I used to live, of course. And so it's kind of like, I do want to get on with some of my own projects, um, but then it's just tough at the moment. But now that I'm in Spain, my mum and dad are here, so they can look after my son sometimes. So I think I'll be able to get on a little bit more with lots of my projects now for a few months. I think you have to pinch, pinch a little bit of time to get some of your own stuff. Exactly, done. yes. Yeah, definitely. It, it's all good. Um, Kaide, it's been uh, been great talking to you. We're going to have you on again and uh, go through some more details about the publishing process and things yes. like that. But yeah. now, thank you very much for coming on. And, uh, yeah, thank you for having me on. It's been nice great to talk to you. Thank you. Yeah. The Winning Wars yeah. podcast will be back. Thanks for watching, <laughs> everybody. Thank you. Cheers.